Good evening, and thank you so much for having me here. I, um, it's really fun for me to get to meet with students and learn from you. Uh, let me just start by telling you why I'm here. So before I went to Washington, to be honest with you, I didn't know much about what the Federal Reserve was. Well, the Federal Reserve is, if you don't already know it, is our nation's central bank. We were created by Congress in 1913, excuse me, a little over 100 years ago. Our jobs are to try to manage the ups and downs of the economy. So if the economy looks like it's overheating, then you'll read in the, maybe on CNBC or in the Wall Street Journal, you'll see the Federal Reserve will rate, raise interest rates to try to slow things down. Or if the economy is limping along, the Federal Reserve will typically cut interest rates to try to boost the economy. And Congress has given us two goals. One is a stable economy we call stable prices. The second goal is maximum employment. As many Americans as possible are able to find jobs who want to find jobs. So if the economy is limping along, typically you're going to have low inflation. You're going to have a lot of people out of work. So the Federal Reserve will then cut interest rates to make it easier to borrow money, to buy a house, or for a, fa a business to build a new factory to try to boost investment and boost the economy, bringing people back to work. Or if the economy looks like it's overheating, we'll do the opposite. We'll raise rates to try to cool things down. So we're always trying to assess where is the economy going? Are, where's the labor market? Are people able to find jobs? So a big part of my specific role at the Minneapolis Fed is to go out around our region and to meet with folks just like yourself to understand what's happening here in the local economy. So our region, Amy said, we represent what's called the Ninth Federal Reserve District. There are 12 of them. The Ninth District is Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and Northwestern Wisconsin. So our jobs literally are to represent you. And I go back to Washington, D.C. eight times a year. All of the presidents of the Federal Reserve Banks get together, and we set interest rates for the country. My job is to represent you and let folks in Washington know what's happening in the local economy here. So that's why I'm here. I'm here to learn from you, to listen to you, and give you a chance to ask me questions. You know, a lot of people are confused about what the Federal Reserve is, what we do. I want to try to illuminate that as much as I can and answer your questions, but also take away from you what's on your mind, what are you all seeing. Now, you know, I gave Amy the excuse of not having to read every twist and turn in my bio. I've had a lot of different twists and turns, so I'm also happy to talk as you're thinking about your own careers. I'm happy to share with you what I've learned. You know, what my career has been marked by lots of changes, right? A lot of you, when I was in college, the idea that I had is the decision I make when I'm coming out of college is so critically important. This is what I'm going to be doing for the next 30 years. That's just not true. Right? You've got lots of time to try different things and to make different changes. And I'm happy to talk you through some of the changes and the choices that I made, if that's interesting to you. So let me, I'm going to, that's, that's, that's it for my prepared remarks. We've got mics here. Let me just start the conversation by asking you, how do you feel about your job prospects? Are there good jobs available from your classmates that have graduated recently? Are companies coming on campus? What's going on? Who wants to go first? I can't imagine you're shy. Come on. We got mics on both sides. Or I can just call on you. We can go that way, too. Oh, I like that. I like that idea. All right, gentlemen up here. Hold on. Tell us your name, please. My name is Jesse. Hi, Jesse. Um, hi. <laughs> um, I don't know. It seems kind of low key. I haven't heard too much from a lot of people. You kind of have to look a little bit harder. It seems to like. What year find are you? A job. I'm a junior, but this is my first year here. I'm a transfer student. Got it. Went to community college for two years. Got it. So you think that you're not hearing much? There's not like there's a ton of activity where there's just tons of jobs around. Because I'll just tell you something. When I travel around our region, the number one complaint I hear from businesses is that they can't find workers. Number one complaint, they say that. That's ironic. And then I say, well, are you raising wages? And usually they say no. All right, first economics class you'll ever take, supply and demand. If you want more of something, you're going to pay more for it. So there are a lot of businesses that want more workers but don't want to pay more. So what I tell them is, that's just whining. All right, I'll know you're serious if you're actually raising wages. So businesses are saying they can't find workers. So I would expect... For students coming out, there should be a lot of jobs available because businesses are all complaining to me that they can't find workers. So, but thanks for going first. Anybody else want to chime in? Or who has the first question? 
Question or comment? Gentlemen, yeah. Hi, Mr. Kashgari. My Hi. name is Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> so every, it seems every few years we hear about, um, from more of the fiscally libertarian wing in Congress, about auditing the Fed. Um, <clears throat> can you explain why or why not that endeavor would be worthwhile? And I guess what are your thoughts on that? And um, what is the disconnect between that legislation and what already goes on in, with the, um, the Government Accountability Office? Sure. Uh, well, thanks for your question. So the Federal Reserve, uh, one thing that's special about the Federal Reserve and about central banks around the world is that we try to insulate it from politics. And this has been a deal that Republicans and Democrats have embraced over the past 30 or 40 years because they don't want, it'd be very tempting, no matter who's in office, if the president and the executive branch control the Fed to just say, you know what, we wanna boost the economy in time for our reelection even if that's not gonna to lead to the long-term best outcome for the US. So Republicans and Democrats got together and said, you know what, let's keep the Fed independent of politics and let them manage the interest rates just on the objectives that we set. And that's a really good compromise that Republicans and Democrats have come up with. So part of that is we meet eight times a year in what's called an FOMC meeting. You might read about this in the paper, Federal Open Market Committee. Those meetings are confidential a few weeks later, we put out minutes, a, kind of a summary of what was discussed. And then five years later, a detailed word-for-word -word transcript is released to the public. Now, the reason there's a five-year delay in that transcript is trying to shield me and my colleagues from having to worry that politicians might get mad at our deliberations. It's literally to try to protect us from the day-to-day -day political fighting that we see on the news every day. So some politicians don't like that. Some politicians say, you know what? We want to get in there and see exactly what they're doing. We don't want to wait five years. We want to get in there now. So when some politicians are saying, we want to audit the Fed, what they're really saying is they want to get in our monetary policy deliberations and examine really minutely how we're making our decisions. Now, the reason why this is a, uh, it's a misguided uh, attack is because we are already under audit. See, it's a great talking point, they say. They say, we want to audit the Fed. Who could be against that? Right? How can you be against auditing a government agency? Well, the fact is we are already audited. We have an independent auditor. KPMG comes in and audits our books every year. If you go to our website, federalreserve.org, on the, on the website itself is a button, click our audit results. And every year the audit results are published. So this is why it's a disingenuous criticism that we're not audited. We are audited. What they're really trying to get at is, we want to break through the political protections, which are protecting the integrity of our deliberations. And I think those, keeping this non-political is very important for the U.S. economy. Okay, Others? So you, other questions? Hi. Um, so what, what, what are your thoughts on the recent Fed, the rate hike, and do you think the economy is ready for a rate hike? Well, I've been, so last year, I voted against the Federal Reserve raised interest rates three times last year, 25.25% each time, and I voted against each of those interest rate increases. And the reason I did, I started out by saying we have a dual mandate, which is stable, a stable economy, stable prices, and maximum employment. Now, in the last 10 years, the headline unemployment rate nationally has fallen from 10% to 4.1%. When the unemployment rate falls that far, we would have expected wage growth to pick up because it's harder for businesses to find workers. They have to pay more to attract those workers. Well, we've been surprised wage growth has not picked up very much. So we keep trying to assess how much slack is left in the labor market, how many workers are available who would like to work. We keep thinking that we've used up all the slack, and yet more Americans are coming into the job market every month. And so I voted against those interest rate increases because I think there's no reason to tap the brakes on the U.S. economy. Allow it to keep strengthening, allow wages to start picking up, allow more workers to come in, and then if inflation then starts to take off, we can always tap the brakes then. So that's been my perspective on monetary policy. And you know, just last month, 300,000 jobs were created. If you look at the U.S. economy overall, 
with population growth, we need about 100,000 jobs a month to keep up with population growth. So if the economy created 300,000 jobs in a month, where did those other 200,000 people come from? They are people who already are here, on the sidelines, out of the job market, re-entering the job market, which is a very, very good thing. So my view is let's allow that to continue. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Yue. So I hold a finance bachelor, and I'm currently working on my master. But my question, actually, I will treat your question with my question, say, because I think the in terms of uh, job opportunities, because I'm currently looking for jobs recently, I figured that uh, those companies, especially like financial companies, since most of students here are from the business school, are looking for kind of more experienced workers rather than very basic new graduates, which they don't give us the opportunity to be more experienced at where they want us to be. And I think a really good opportunity will be like for some internships. I'm not really sure how much the internship will be paid or how many internships are open for grad students, I mean, just for students. So once people graduate, they feel, okay, I want to find a job, but we just learn whatever we learn from college, which doesn't match with the employer's perspective. I think that's kind of the reason and kind of the confused I'm currently having right now. But that's basically like a condition or what I've learned recently. And I think a question I might want to ask is, it's maybe more in general, because I'm more interested in, there are rumors coming in saying the Federal Reserve of America is going to like shrinking the table recently in the next couple of years. Or what? Like shrinking the table, like cutting the budget of the kind of, yeah. So I'm more interested in like what kind of process or what kind of future procedure will be on um, that kind of thing, and will that be related to the recent, I, can, I think there is a recent decline of the US currency, will be some connected, I mean, connection between those two things and uh, what will be the invasion in the future. Yeah, okay. thank you. Well, first of all, thanks for your comments on the job market. You know, uh, let me start there, and then I'll go to the balance sheet and the currency. Um, as the job market's been getting tighter, we're seeing businesses have to do more extraordinary things to find workers. So typically they'll say, in the conversations I have with them, well, we can't find skilled workers. And then I'll say to them, okay, well, why don't you train them? And oftentimes they don't have a good answer. But more often now they're saying, okay, we are. You know, we're, gonna, we're giving workers a chance and we'll train them ourselves just because we need folks and we can't otherwise find them. So I think as the economy continues to strengthen, you're gonna see more and more businesses say, you know what, we're gonna take the new grad and we're gonna invest in them and we're gonna train them. And so I think your comments are right on and hopefully businesses are waking up to that because they don't, they don't really have a choice if they wanna keep growing as a company. Now in terms of the balance sheet, so let me just talk about this for a second. Typically the way the Federal Reserve adjusts the economy is we raise and lower interest rates to try to boost the economy or slow it down. And again, by raising interest rates, it makes it more expensive for a business to go build a new factory because they have to borrow money from their bank and if they're paying a higher rate of interest, it's more expensive, so they're less likely to do it. Or we cut interest rates to make it cheaper for that business to go build that new factory. Now, when the Great Recession hit in 2008 and 2009, the Federal Reserve cut interest rates to zero. And then the question was, is the Federal Reserve out of ammunition? Are we, is there nothing else we can do? We've already cut rates to zero. What else can we do to try to stimulate the economy? Well, one thing the Fed did, and the European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England, we embarked on something called quantitative easing, where we started buying up treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities to drive down long-term interest rates. So the Federal Reserve basically bought around $4 trillion worth of bonds out there, government bonds and government-backed bonds, to try to drive down long-term interest rates, again, to make it cheaper for individuals and businesses to get loans to be able to invest and expand their businesses, et cetera. So now we have $4 trillion of bonds on our balance sheet. And we've embarked on a plan to gradually shrink that as the economy heals, going back down to more of a normal size. So as those bonds mature, the US Treasury Department writes a check. Like if you took out, a ten, if you bought, any of you, bought a 10-year Treasury bond, you can sell it after a year or two or you could hold it for 10 years. And after 10 years, when the bond matures, 
the US Treasury Department will write you a check for the amount, the principal amount of that bond. So that's what we did. The Federal Reserve bought $4 trillion worth of bonds. And as they are now maturing, coming due, the US Treasury Department is writing us a check to pay us back for the principal amount of those bonds. So our portfolio is gradually now shrinking back down to a more normal size. And it'll take a few years for that process to complete. Now, you mentioned what does it mean for the dollar. Now, the US dollar recently has been falling. It's been weakening, which is a little bit surprising because the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates. Usually, you would think if one country, let's say the US versus the Euro, the Eurozone, you would think that if the US is raising interest rates more quickly than the Euro, the Eurozone, the dollar will appreciate relative to the Euro because people are going to want to take advantage of the higher interest rates in America. But currencies move around for lots of different reasons. And so that's not been what's happening lately. But I don't think it's because of the quantitative easing or the roll off of the Fed's balance sheet. I think it's just broader macroeconomic factors. But currencies move around for a lot of reasons. So not a complete answer to your question, but the best I can do. Lady here has a question. Hi, my name Hi. is Rachel. Um, so about a year ago, Janet Yellen said that she thinks that the decline in the labor force participation rate could possibly be due to the opioid crisis. And I know the fourth di district has done some work on it um, with that largely being contributed towards that. And I was wondering if there was any indicator that the ninth district is being impacted by this opioid crisis, especially with um, employers not being able to find employees. Well, we, uh, we, there's definitely a factor. When I travel around the 9th District, I do hear about opioids from community leaders and healthcare officials and other drugs, uh, meth, uh, heroin. I hear about that a lot, in, especially in rural communities. Also on, uh, on reservations, you hear a lot about various drug abuse. And it is a factor. We don't know how big a factor it is. And so if you look at, you asked about labor force participation. So let me just take you through this for a second. The unemployment rate that gets a lot of attention in the press, which is right now 4.1% nationally, that only measures people who already have a job or who are looking for a job, right? So you have to be in the job market when they ask you that question. That's the 4.1%. Then you have people who are, don't have a job but are in the labor force or outside of the labor force, excuse me. They could be out of the labor force for a whole bunch of different reasons. You're in school. You're not considered actively looking for a job if you're full-time or you're retired. So we know, looking at demographics of the country, that labor force participation is going to be declining just because our population is aging. More and more people are of retirement age are retiring. So you would expect labor force participation to be declining just because we're getting older. So another measure we look at is prime age labor force participation, age 25 to 55. The reason that we look at that is we get to miss most students. Because if you're in school, then you're unemployed for a good reason. So, we, so let's skip that for, for a moment. 25 to 55, you're also before your retirement age. So if we look at people 25 to 55, that's also low. So now the question is, why is that low? Why are people aged 25 to 55, a smaller percentage of them working today than were working 10 years ago? So the possible answers are opioids is part of it. Another answer is people are just out of the job market and are waiting for the job market to strengthen and come back in. Uh, there are some theorists, let me, I'll tell you the truth here, some economists speculate that young men are out of the labor force. I kid you not, because they're playing video games. Right? You've probably heard this. It's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, and it is true that video games have gotten better over the last 10 years. But can it explain that decline? I don't know. And I would also say that, you know, Americans are not the only video game players in the world. Right? Other countries also have access to the same quality video games that we have, and yet they're not seeing the same declines. So if you look at prime age labor force participation, America has not recovered from before the financial crisis. Europe has recovered. Canada has recovered. Japan has recovered. And so it's a conundrum. Why has not America recovered? And that points to maybe opioids is part of the problem because maybe those other countries are not having the opioid epidemic that we are having here. But we do not have great data on being able to tell you, is opioids, are they 20% of the problem or 50% of the problem? We just don't know. Sorry, long answer to your question, but good question. Um, I have a, geez, 
As a mechanical engineering student here at UMD, uh, your past with mechanical engineering like really interests me. So I have two brief questions then. Uh, so what made you kind of make the switch from mechanical engineering to, you know, being <laughs> uh, working at the Federal Reserve? And also, how has your past with mechanical engineering affected your thinking in the in your current field right yeah. now? So I did my bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering, and then I got a job working on NASA space missions, uh, and I loved it. I was in R&D in the research labs doing cutting edge research, and I loved it. It was so intellectually stimulating. The path before me was my managers were encouraging me to get my PhD, which I thought about, but I knew if I got my PhD, then I would really be committing myself to a career doing research, and I wasn't ready to make that type of a commitment. So I said, let me go to business school and just learn about business, and who knows what it will lead to. I had no idea. I just went to get my MBA. So I went to Wharton to get my MBA, and from that I ended up joining Goldman in San Francisco as a technology investment banker, advising tech companies on mergers and IPOs. It was a way to try to combine my engineering and business. Um, so that's no better answer than that. I mean, you know, why did you choose mechanical engineering as opposed to another type of engineering? You know, I didn't have a very good answer when I made those decisions. So we all make lots of decisions, you know, based on gut instinct at the time and what feels right at the time. And I have no regrets. I love being an engineer and going to engineering school. Now, did it help me? It helped me profoundly. Because when I went to Washington, D.C. to work at the Treasury Department, I used my engineering like crazy. Not the actual thermodynamics or fluid dynamics, but the problem solving skills. What is policy making? Policy making at the end of the day is about problem solving. It's about a public policy problem, a riddle that you need to unravel and try to solve given a certain set of tools. That's what engineers do. And so what I found when I went to Washington is I used my engineering much more than I used my MBA. My MBA was nice to have, but the core problem solving skills of engineering is something that has helped me throughout my career, even though I'm not using the actual thermodynamics or fluid dynamics in the moment. My name is Jake. Uh, Hi, just Jake. Qu or curious, what do you think the aging uh, workforce is going to, how is that going to affect monetary policy in the future? Well, um, so over the last 40 years, something's happened around advanced economies, which is interest rates have gradually fallen from around 1980 on. And we talk about at the Federal Reserve something called a neutral real interest rate. So let's say the headline interest rate right now, the nominal interest rate is around 1.5%. If you, you actually don't care what the nominal rate is. You care about what the interest rate is compared to inflation, which we call the real interest rate. So if, there, if right now inflation is around 1.5%, I'm going to just ballpark it. If nominal interest rates are around 1.5% and you subtract off the, inter, the inflation rate, the real interest rate today is around zero. So around zero percent. Now that has gradually come down over the past 30 or 40 years. We think it has come down. We don't exactly know why. And we don't control the real interest rate. We control the nominal interest rate. We think it has come down because of things like demographics and productivity, these big macroeconomic forces that are at work in the economy. So what we're doing is you've got this gradual declining interest rate in advanced economies around the world. We are managing interest rates up and down around this trend. But that trend is not set by us. That trend is set by things like demographics things like productivity growth. So if our society continues to age, and it appears to be, and Japan's, and Europe, our best guess is that's going to mean interest rates are going to be low in the foreseeable future. Now, are they going to stay at zero? Are they going to go up a little bit? You know, they'll probably move around some, but they're probably going to be lower than they were 30 or 40 years ago because of the changing demographics of our society. Now, another big factor related to demographics is just economic growth. Most people want more economic growth. More economic growth means we have more money to spend on entitlements, more money to spend on defense, on education, et cetera. Well, where does economic growth come from? It comes from two things. It comes from productivity growth, and that means technology development, inventing new things, or giving workers more skills. So you getting an education is boosting your own productivity. So productivity growth is half of the equation. The other half of the equation is population growth. More workers to build things, more consumers to buy things. Well, our population growth has slowed way down because we're just not having kids at the same rate that we were 40 or 50 years ago. So the same reason that you said our society is aging is the same reason that our population growth has also slowed down. 
So now, when I go around the 9th District, I always tell audiences, you have three choices. So you can either, number one, accept slower growth. Number two, you can do what Japan is trying to do, which is subsidize fertility, pay people to have more babies. Literally, everybody laughs when I say it, but it's true. You, know, you can give out tax credits and free childcare to try, try to encourage families to have more kids to boost our fertility rate. Or number three, you can embrace immigration. And that's math. You can accept slower growth, subsidize fertility, or embrace immigration. That's math. Now, Japan, culturally, is very resistant to immigration. So they, can't, they don't have that option. That's why they're turning to the, the tough option of trying to subsidize fertility to get their birth rate back up. So we as a country have to decide what we want to do if we want to live in a low growth environment. So that's, I gave you a lot in response to your question. But demographics is enormously important to what our economy looks like and what the future holds. Hello, Hi. Mr. Kashkari. Um, my name is Zach, and uh, I'm conducting an independent study on the importance of community banks. And I just had a couple questions. Um, what do you think is the largest and most prevalent threat facing community banks in the next five to 10 years? And then also, um, there's a controversy about the Dodd-Frank regulation. Um, if you just want to touch on that and whether or not it is a large, has a large impact on <clears throat> community banks or not. Let me start with the second and I'll go to the first. So the Dodd-Frank Act was a bank regulatory bill that was passed after the financial crisis to try to prevent crises like that from happening again. And it did do some good, but in my view, it did not go far enough to end the problem of too big to fail banks. But it also saddled little banks, community banks that are not risky for the US economy with a bunch of regulations that it's very expensive for them to keep up with. And that puts them at a competitive disadvantage relative to the giant banks, right? If you're a giant bank and you have to add a compliance officer, no big deal. If you're a 10 person bank, and you have to hire another compliance officer, it's a very big deal. And so in some ways, it put community banks at a bigger disadvantage than they already were. And by the way, there's a bill pending right now, the Senate has just passed, if I'm not mistaken, it's going to the House now, a bill, a law to try to relax some of the regulations on community banks to level the playing field. Now, as much as they say that Dodd-Frank is what's dooming community banks, I think there's a lot of other things too. Number one, you've got, uh, rural populations that are leaving rural communities and going to cities. And so there's just less of a market there for community banks. Uh, you've also got uh, older generations of bankers whose kids don't want to stay in the banking business. And so there are generational issues of who do they pass the bank on to going forward. And that's leading them to have to sell out to bigger banks to try to you know, get something for their business. And then third, technology. Right? I have a bank account at a big bank, but I almost never, ever, ever go into a branch. Right, if somebody gives me a check, I take a picture of it with my iPhone, I deposit it that way. All of my bills are paid automatically online. Uh, the use of technology in banking has, driven, has increased a lot. It's very, very hard and expensive for little tiny community banks to offer all of those services because the technology is just expensive and you need to be able to spread it over millions of customers, not over thousands of customers. And so I think the community banking model, you know, this decline in community banks has been going on for decades. This is not a new phenomenon. And so regulations is part of it, but there are a lot of other economic factors that are driving this trend as well. My name is David. Where um, are you, David? Right oh, hi there. Right in front of you. I was wondering, is the U.S. financial system adequately prepared for LIBOR to be phased out, uh, financial institutions? making commercial loans are still pricing five or six year facilities based on a rate that will no longer exist in a few years? Why, well, it's a good question. Um, I don't have a great answer. I'm, I'm assuming the answer is yes because people know it's coming and they're making provisions for it. Uh, so I'm aware of the issue, but I have not heard that this is a pressing issue that a lot of people are particularly worried about right now. But I might be wrong about that. And so I would need to go look into it further before I can give you a definitive answer. Again, I think I'm aware of it. I think most banks are aware of you know, the challenge with LIBOR. So I'm assuming that they have their management systems under control. But I don't have a better answer for you than that, unfortunately. But thanks for asking it. Hi. Uh, hi, yeah, second question. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain technology? And <clears throat> how, if there was going to be a, a regulatory push from the federal government, 
How would they be able to do that given that the nature of blockchain and crypto is, is so decentralized? Well, I'm a, I've become, I was more enthusiastic about cryptocurrencies a few years ago. I'm pretty uh, disappointed in the evolution so far. And here's the reason. Uh, if you, let's say you want to go print your own dollars. And you go into your basement with your laser printer and you start printing out dollar bills. You're going to get a knock on your door from the United States Secret Service and they're going to put handcuffs on you and they're going to put you in jail. And the reason is there's only one entity that's allowed to print dollars and that's the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. The Treasury prints it on behalf of the Federal Reserve. Congress has decided that we need to keep dollars scarce and we, will, we need to control the amount of them so we can control the currency and the economy. If you could all go print your own dollars, what would happen? Everybody would go print their own dollars, and then the dollar would cr crater. So let's now think about that, and now think about cryptocurrencies. So the creators of Bitcoin were very proud of themselves. They said, we have limited the number of Bitcoins that can ever be mined. I think it's 21 million, if I'm not mistaken, right? So there can never be more than 21 million crypt, uh, Bitcoins ever printed. And that, that's how you control inflation from taking off. That's true. but. The barrier to entry for you going and creating something that looks just like Bitcoin is zero. So now there's over 15 or 1,600 different flavors of cryptocurrencies out there. There's Banana Coin. I kid you not. I thought that there's some version of Jalapeno Coin I read about the other day. It's become, it's become a farce. And so since there are so many alternatives out there, even if the number of Bitcoin is limited, if you create things that look just like Bitcoin, how, do, how am I supposed to tell them apart? It's like if, think about gold. Gold has served its value in societies for thousands of years. If I could go in my basement and create a metal that looks just like gold, that weighs as much as gold, that has every other property as gold, then haven't I effectively just created more gold? Yes. So this is the fundamental flaw of all of these cryptocurrencies, at least so far. Nobody's come up with a way to create barriers from all these new ones coming in. So, Everyone says the blockchain, the underlying technology has potential, and that's probably true. Maybe it has lots of different applications, but the idea that any of these cryptocurrencies are credible competitors to the dollar or the euro or the yen or the pound, not in the foreseeable future. Gentleman behind you, where did he go? Oh yeah, oh, same question, all right. Others? Well, I guess it's me. Yep. Um, I kind of have three questions here, so one, uh, how do you see quantitative tightening affecting uh, yields on bonds? Uh, two, how do you well, like how do you see um, government spending affecting the economy? Uh, are you a big positive or a negative on that? And then the third one is how do you see tariffs affecting inflation? Well, uh, so first of all, quantitative tightening. So as I talked about the balance sheet shrinking, one would expect that as the balance sheet shrinks down to a more normal size, that you would see yields, longer term yields, creep back up. So as we bought all these ten year bonds, as an example, you would expect the yields at the 10-year to come down, and now as we shrink our portfolio, you would think they would come back up. It's an open question how much more they're gonna come back up. We don't really know for sure. You know, the, the funny thing about economics is it's a big part of it's about expectations. So we've already signaled to the market, this is how our balance sheet is gonna shrink over time, and it's a very predictable manner. So one school of thought says, well, the markets already see it coming, they've already priced it into the yield, and maybe yields aren't gonna move much from here. Another school of thought is that's fine that the markets see it coming, but as it happens, and as Treasury keeps issuing bonds, then you're going to see yields climb back up slowly. We don't know for sure. But directionally, you would think it would lead to higher yields rather than lower yields. Uh, second was the budget. So the Congress passed a big tax cut, and then they passed a big spending package. And we think that that's going to be a short-term boost for the economy. Right? If, if you go out and spend more, that's more aggregate demand in the economy. That should be a short-term boost for the economy, like a stimulus. Does that lead to higher long-term growth? That's unclear, right? Because if you just go out and spend money, you know, you can spend money on a vacation, that's not gonna make you more competitive or more productive over your long-term as opposed to spending money on your education. So the question is, does all this additional spending actually increase the productive capacity of the US economy? We don't know. And so right now, I think most of us have taken up our forecasts for the next year or two, but I haven't changed my long-term forecast yet. I haven't seen the evidence that the long-term growth rate has boosted. And then lastly, tariffs. I mean, if this goes down the path of a full-fledged trade war, 
that's obviously going to be very bad for the U.S. economy and for the global economy. You would think tariffs on the margin are going to boost inflation because products that we're going to buy from abroad are going to be more expensive. So that would be an inflationary force. But the question is how widespread they are and how high they are. And the real downward spiral is if there's a crisis of confidence. So let's say there's a escalating trade tensions between the U.S. and China, and it spooks investors around the world. Then you would imagine the stock market falling. You could imagine corporate bond spreads expanding, so it becomes more expensive for businesses to borrow. All of that could have a downward spiral of confidence on the U.S. economy, and that clearly we need to try to avoid. Others? A gentleman here in the front has another. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, over. All right. All right. All right, well, you can ask me and I'll repeat it while the mic's going there. What's your question? All right, it's okay. <laughs> Sir. Hi, my name is Titus. Um, so <clears throat> China is pushing for the yuan to be accepted as payment for purchasing crude oil. Uh, what, is, what, impa um, what impact would this have on the dollar and as the world reserve currency and is it possible that in the future the yuan could be used as benchmark for the global oil transactions? You know, it's certainly possible. The Chinese economy is uh, a huge economy, and as they develop their financial markets, it's certainly possible that their currency could become another reserve currency or a competitor for the dollar. But I guess I don't see it happening in the near term because they have so far to go in developing their capital markets, in developing their bond markets. I'll give you a... a a much more near-term competitor to the dollar would be the euro, right? The eurozone is a big economy if you look at the eurozone as a whole, and they do have developed capital markets, and yet the euro is not the global reserve currency. It's still the dollar. And so is it possible that the euro will become the reserve currency instead of the dollar? It's certainly possible in the long term. Anything's possible. Or certainly the Chinese currency could be. But I think China has a long, long way to go before they've developed their capital markets to be competitive. Um, hi, Mr. Kushkar. Where are, um, there you are. Yep. Sorry. Hi. And I also have interest about um, cryptocurrencies. So, just as you explained about its influence on the real currency system. So, my question is: Do you have any prediction on its short term and long term? I mean, is it a do you think it's a person, people's one-time interest, or it's a long-term trend? My guess is: I mean, there's so many people who are experimenting. Mm -hmm. And experimenting is good, so you let a thousand flowers bloom and you see which, what sticks if something grows. Is it going to be, I said there's over 1,500 types of cryptocurrency today. Maybe it's, that's a month old, maybe it's 1,600 now. Maybe it's version 15,000 that'll actually be useful. I don't know. Right now, it's not. Right now, it's a novelty. It's like a beanie baby or a fidget spinner, <laughs> right? It's just a trinket. Um, but could some version in the future actually be useful? It's certainly possible. But, you know, I have no way of knowing when that's going to happen or which version is actually going to be useful. But I think there's enough interest that people will continue experimenting, trying to find something useful with this technology. All right, Nigel, next. Um, so you Where talked about you? expanding the deficit. Hi there. Um, uh, with this deficit expanding, do you think we'll ever reach a point where uh, we can no longer operate under such a deficit. I mean, we're so dependent on the global economy. Do you think that this will ever change? And we need well, to it could. You know, the, we talked about a moment ago about the Eurozone, for example, or China. The best thing the U.S. has going for us right now is that we are the strongest economy in the world. And so investors all around the world are saying, look, we know the U.S. has challenges, but we feel more confident in the U.S. than we do in Europe or in Asia, as an example. Imagine that Europe gets its house together, its act together. And now all of a sudden, Europe could become a more attractive place for investors to send their money as a safe place to invest. That would then shorten our runway where we'd have to get our own house in order. So it's not just about what we do here. It's how we're doing relative to other major economies around the world. So we can't do this forever. I mean, we can't run bigger and bigger and bigger deficits forever. At some point, we have to get our fiscal house in order to maintain our relative economic competitiveness relative to Europe, relative to Asia. Well, so this is a, you know, hopefully you all have learned that, you know, fiscal policy and monetary policy are separate. So Congress has said, we're going to keep our hands off the Fed. They're going to leave monetary policy to us. 
But the budget and tax rates and the deficit, that's all fiscal policy. That's for Congress and the executive and the president to come to an agreement on and to try to get their house in order. So that's, I mean, to be, I'm, I don't mean to pass the buck, but that's literally, that's not our role. Hi. Oh, oh, where are you? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Hi, uh, does the Fed have a contingency plan when the next financial crisis arrives, or in, will it do what it did in 08, uh, or will it be more like a deal with it as it arrives situation? Well, um, so a couple things. One is the Fed did put in place with Dodd-Frank tougher rules, so the biggest banks are stronger than they were in 2006 and 2007. But in my opinion, we haven't done enough. So the Minneapolis Fed came out with a plan that's much more aggressive in trying to address the too big to fail issue, the idea that these big banks could bring down the US economy. So I think we could do more, number one. Number two, we have a whole group of people at the Federal Reserve in Washington who are looking out for financial stability risks. Big shock, something that could hit the US economy that could tip us over and create another crisis. Now, we don't see anything on the horizon like that, but that's cold comfort because we never do. I mean, that's the nature of crises is you never see them happening. If you saw it coming, if you saw the car driving at you, you would slow down or you would you know, steer clear of it. It's always a thing that you don't see coming that creates the crisis. So we're looking, we don't see anything right now, but that doesn't, that's not very comforting. And then in terms of responding, I, I think we learned a lot as an institution about what worked during the crisis, but crises tend to not be exactly like the last one. So I, I think some of what we learned would be very useful but chances are whatever would trigger that next crisis would require some custom response at that time as well. And so, you know, partly we'd be responding in the moment, would be my guess. Sir. Hey there, borrowing a thought from my professor over there. Um, essentially, I understand that these monetary and fiscal policy, two different time frames, but um, I'm curious if it's been difficult trying to sort of um, have like a restrictive uh, monetary policy while we're having, you know, government uh, spending, tax cuts, and sort of trying to coordinate the two? Yeah. You know, we've been, one of the big surprises for us is that inflation has been coming in below our 2% target for basically the last 10 years. We've been at around 1.5, 1.6% inflation. You would have thought, with the job market getting stronger, that would lead to higher wages and that would lead to more inflation. So it's possible this additional spending will actually help the Federal Reserve boost the economy a little bit to reach our inflation target. The question is, will it lead to an overheating? We just don't know. Will it lead to just a short-term boost and then it goes back, you know, as the stimulus wears off, it goes back to a lower growth rate? Again, we don't know. We're trying to make our best estimates of it. So I wouldn't say that we're trying to coordinate policy. What we do at the Fed is we look at what Congress does and then we build that into our economic models of how we think the U.S. economy is going to behave over the next few years and then we come up with the optimal monetary policy based on how we think the economy is going to behave. And so there's a lot of uncertainty right now about what do these new fiscal measures mean for the economy three, four, five years from now. And we're not sure. Hi, Mr. Kashkari. Um, I was just wondering what your outlook is for the real estate market with the yield curve flattening and mortgage interest rates seeming to be uh, just going up at no uh, with no end in sight. Uh, what's your thoughts on buying a house when I graduate from college? <laughs> well, um, sure. I think the I don't think the current economic environment is is why why you should should or should not buy a house. I think a much more important factor because the transaction costs in buying a house are so high. You know, but by the time you go through real estate agents and appraisals and inspections, there's a lot of upfront money that you end up having to spend. I think the more important question is, are you going to be there for a long time? If you think you're going to stay in a market, even if you change jobs, but you stay in that market for five, 10 years, then buying a house probably is a you know, reasonable decision. If you think you're going to move every two or three years to another location, the transaction costs are probably going to kill you. So to me, that's more important. I don't know if the real estate market's going to go up or going to flatten off or going to you know, tick down. I don't know. Um, but if you're in the house long enough, you could probably withstand those natural ups and downs of a market. And so I wish I had a better answer for you than that. I wanted to go back again to, you were talking about the foreseeable horizon um, was something that could tip over the U.S. economy. Um, last figure I saw, I think uh, student debt was $1.3 trillion. Um, and as we know, default on homes um, led to the 2008 crisis. And in the foreseeable future with schools being, having trouble 
balancing their books, um, I would expect an increase in tuition. As it keeps going forward, how do you think that could affect the U.S. economy? Well, I think it's an enormous challenge, and we have to come up, again, Fed can't do it, but we do as a country have to come up with a solution. We know over time education is just becoming more important. It's not becoming less important, it's becoming more important. That means we need to be able to give more and more young Americans the ability to get a high quality education, whether it's through a traditional four year school or through other types of trade schools, et cetera. Education is only becoming more important. And the answer cannot be, well, we just saddle students with more and more and more debt. Right? That's not a sustainable strategy for our country. And so it's something that we have to come up with a solution to, and whether it's different delivery vehicles to try to reach more students at scale, at lower cost, we need to try everything. But it can't just be saddling students with more debt. You know, when the crisis hit, state budgets were whacked because of the recession. So then state legislators turned to students and said, you know what, here's our outlet. You can just take on more debt. And that happened all around the country. And so student debt loads climbed all around the country in part in response to the financial crisis. And so I don't have an answer of how to solve it other than knowing we do need to solve it because for the US to maintain its economic competitiveness going forward, we have to lead the world in how educated our workforce is. And so it's just gonna become more important. Hi. I just had a question, just on your personal experience when you worked at the Treasury. I was wondering what it was like, kind of, when the financial crisis hit, um, working with like Hank Paulson, and specifically like the weeks when you know Lehman Brothers was maybe going to go, well, he did go, and then Bear Stearns being saved. Like, what was it like there? And do you think Hank Paulson made the right decision letting Lehman fail? So, um, the financial crisis, the way I describe it, is you know I've never served in the military. We met with veterans earlier today. Uh, and I was, we were never getting shot at, but it felt like we were at war, where every second of every day, we were just trying to keep the economy together for one more day. And that's how we judge success. And we viewed that if we failed, it wouldn't just be a dozen banks that would fail, it'd be thousands of banks failing, and then we'd be in a Great Depression scenario. Instead of 10% unemployment, we'd be facing 25% unemployment, which they saw in the 1930s. So it was incredibly intense. And it was a team of us, so the good news is we had a team of people who were dedicated to try to get us through this, and it was Treasury, the Fed, uh, working together. Really good people. Now, as for Lehman, this is really complicated. Um, <clears throat> the Fed's authorities, by law, Congress said to the Fed, you can lend money to anybody, but you must be secured. So you must have some kind of collateral, mortgages or something as collateral. So when Bear Stearns, uh, went belly up, effectively, in March of 2008. They died a sudden death. One day they were fine, and a few weeks later, markets lost confidence in them, and they were all of a sudden gonna be out of money and going into bankruptcy, and that's when they called Treasury and the Fed. So the Fed lent $30 billion, but they were collateralized by mortgages that Bear Stearns had on their books. Well, after Bear Stearns was rescued, the markets then turned their attention to Lehman Brothers, the next weakest bank. And over the next six months, Lehman died a slow death, pledging whatever collateral they had to whoever would lend them money in the private sector. So when they finally were on death's doorstep and they said, hey, we're about to die, the Fed said, okay, where's your collateral? And they said, we don't have any. So there was no legal way for the Federal Reserve to lend money to Lehman Brothers while they could to Bear Stearns. So then after Lehman went under, we went to Congress to ask for the TARP authority, which is the program that I ran. And what was special about the TARP is it was the only program in the federal government that allowed us to invest money on an unsecured basis. So we could do an unsecured loan or we could invest equity. And that way, we were able to go into things like whether it's AIG or Bank of America or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley and be able to put in equity. And there was no other legal authority. So when Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke and Tim Geithner talk about it, it's really about these nuances of US legal authorities more than it is about picking one versus picking the other. Uh, my name is Sean O'Leary. And uh, my question just basically being, uh, it's kind of relatively newer in the news. It's with Wells Fargo. Uh, there was a consent order that uh, was placed upon Wells Fargo. And that was due to their practices. Um, there were two plans that were supposed to be implemented by the beginning of this month. Um, one was with their improvement of the effectiveness of its board 
and uh, the improvement of their risk management practices. Uh, could you go into any real details with how they're doing, I guess, with that, and if they are improving? Well, for two reasons I can't. Number one, I don't know anything. Uh, they're regulated by the San Francisco Fed, not by the Minneapolis Fed. And number two, even if I did, I wouldn't be allowed to tell you. And so I apologize. I just can't because I, I don't know. And there would be, we're not allowed to discuss individual bank regulatory and supervisory matters with the general public. We have to go through the appropriate channels. So I wouldn't be allowed to, even if I knew anything. But in this case, I don't know anything, so I apologize. That's okay. Yes. Hi. Um, another couple questions. Um, so you talked about that the uh, Fed worked with the Treasury Department during that crisis. Um, do you feel like that's going to become almost a normal thing or occur more in the next financial or the next recession or the next crisis that they're going to be working together? Or, and then also, um, what tools with the low interest rates, um, what are the major tools you would, if we had a recession, what, would, what tools would you use other than like quantitative easing or what other tools do you think would be the major players? Well, I would expect that in a time of financial crisis, an actual crisis, not just a run-of-the-mill recession, I would expect coordination between Treasury and the Fed as there was in 2008. I think that's important. I think it was necessary. I think it was a good thing. I don't think that's necessarily true in run-of-the-mill recessions that we typically have where you know, the Treasury is funding itself and deciding how much they want to spend, and the Fed is trying to manage interest rates for the goals that Congress has given us. Now, if there is a future recession, what we've said we would do, we have a number of different tools. Number one tool is cutting interest rates. That's our bread and butter. We know how to do that. Then you get to zero, the zero lower bound. Number two is we can go to quantitative easing, as you said, which is expand our balance sheet to drive down long-term interest rates. Let me just spend a second on this. The interest rate that we move up and down, it's called the federal funds rate. It's an overnight interest rate. It's an interest rate for one day. Well, if you're a borrower, you don't actually care about what overnight rates are. You care about what long-term interest rates are. You're borrowing to buy a house or to build a factory if you're a company. So really what matters is long-term interest rates. And we can affect long-term interest rates by moving short-term interest rates up and down. But through quantitative easing, by buying long-term bonds, we can also move long-term interest rates down. So that's the second tool. A third tool is through expectations. By signaling what we're going to do, we can actually, if we tell you we are likely going to keep interest rates low for a long period of time, that will change your expectations for the path of interest rates over the next five or ten years. And through the what we call the expectations channel, it's a communications, we can actually have an effect on long-term interest rates. So those are three tools that we feel like we have. Actual interest rates overnight, quantitative easing, and through interest rate expectations affecting these economic outcomes. Hi. Um, Hi. So the, uh, the idea, the concept of too big to fail is kind of a problem. <laughs> and do you think that it would have been better to just allow the United States to go to the Great Depression in 2008 instead of bailing them out? And what do you think some future solutions are to that problem? Uh, I do not think it would have been better to be in a Great Depression because, uh, you know, look at, look at the how much pain the U.S. economy has had over the last decade. Even though we avoided that terrible outcome, it's still been incredibly painful for American families, many of whom are still out of the job market and only now re-entering the job market. So imagine if there was many times worse than that. I think that's a huge cost to pay for society if we can avoid it. But <clears throat> I also agree with you that we want to try to end this too big to fail problem. And the plan that we've come up with is make the banks have about 20, or excuse me, about double the amount of equity capital that they have today. So when I bought a house, the bank made me put 20% down on my house. The reason I had to put 20% down on my house, that 20% down is there to protect the bank in case I get into trouble. Because they can take the house, they can sell it, then they got 20% cushion to pay back the, the mortgage. That's what that 20% down is for. Well, big banks in America today have about half that amount on their own investments. So if we made the biggest banks in America put 20% down on their investments, that 20% would be there to protect us, to protect taxpayers in case the banks run into trouble. Now, banks don't want to do that because it's better for their stock price to have very low capital. And they want as high a stock price as they possibly can get. 
That's why we're arguing at the Minneapolis Fed, uh, we're not concerned about their stock prices. We're concerned about protecting American taxpayers. That's why we need big banks to have more, more equity. And that'll really address too big to fail. Maybe one more question, Neil, right. and then we'll, we're having a lot of fun, but we'll have to shut it down. Sure. So. No, I appreciate the time you all have given. Last Hi, question. Uh, Sam here. How should investors interpret the actions of the Fed with, with respect to the FOMC's recent rate moves? Are we in a policy normalization or an intentional, less accommodative monetary environment? The Federal Reserve Bank has notoriously overshot rate movements targets in the past, and should we expect this to happen again? Well, we certainly won't intentionally overshoot um, <laughs> interest rates. So this is a question. I, went, I mentioned earlier that there's this concept of the neutral interest rate, and it's fallen, and it's now somewhere around zero. We're not exactly sure where it is. And this is what's hard about this, is because we cannot actually measure, directly measure, where's the neutral rate. We have to try to estimate it. So some, I think we're pretty close to neutral right now. Some people think we're still below neutral, and that we have a few more interest rate hikes to go to get back to neutral. And so this is a debate that we're having. Are we at neutral? Are we below neutral? How much more do we have to go? So we're always looking at the data of, you know, if the job market keeps one signal, if the job market keeps creating lots of jobs, that suggests that we probably are still providing some stimulus to the economy through monetary policy. If the job market cools off, then maybe we're closer to neutral. And so we're trying to make sense of very different signals that we're getting to figure out how close we are to neutral. Nobody, I can assure you, nobody in the committee wants to tip the US economy into recession. We all want the expansion to continue as long as possible. But some of these measurements are judgment rather than science. That was a great question to end on and a terrific answer. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank all of you.